Good morning. Let's all stand together. You can grab your hymnal if you like. We're going to sing page 26, Come Thou Found. Welcome to Faith Baptist Church this morning. Here we sing, Come Thou Found. Come Thou Found of every blessing In my heart to sing thy praise Streams of mercy never ceasing Offer songs of modest praise Is me This morning, we're going to sing another one together. Uh, let me make a couple of announcements before we do. Kids, normally uh, we would have you go downstairs and the choir goes down, but because it's Faith Mission Sunday, we're all going to remain upstairs this morning, and so we can all partake of that together. So if you see kids running out of the auditorium, you have my permission to trip them, knock them down, do whatever you got to do. We're all going to remain in the auditorium this morning. So kids, you need to take sermon notes. And if you're looking for those gift cards we talked about earlier in the week, you need to take, turn in all of your sermon notes, and there's sermon note sheets in the back. So when the choir goes down in a few minutes, and we shake hands, make sure you grab those sermon notes. Go ahead and find the next page in your, in your uh, songbook, so page 170. And let's sing about being saved this morning, page 170. Sing it out good and loud, church. Yeah. 
Y'all are kind of mumbling your way through what ought to be one of the greatest songs you can sing as a child of God. We're going to sing that third verse. The third verse is my favorite verse. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, the Father he spake and his will it was done. Great price of my pardon, his own precious son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Let's sing that third verse together. And Brother Luke, we're going to do the chorus a cappella. All right, so choir, you know your parts on that. Everybody blend like one big choir this morning. Sing it like you mean it. All right, all together on the third verse, think about those words. Sing it out really loud. You're starting to get it. We're going to do it one more time, all right? We always accuse the, the Pentecostal crowd of singing the same song over and over again. I was in a service one time in a Pentecostal church that lasted three hours, not kidding, and they sang four songs the entire time. We're not going to do that this morning, but I think you're, you just need to stretch your vocal cords a little bit, and you're sounding really good. Going to do it just like you did. Man, it sounds so good. I, I'm going to sing with you a little bit this time, but I was listening last time. Do it just like you did. Same verse again, third verse. Lift your voice. Sing it like... Sing it like we might hear the trumpet sound in the middle of this verse. Wouldn't that be all right to go home to heaven singing about being saved? That'd be all right with me. Let's sing it just like you did. Lift your voices good and loud on the third verse. Sins are all pardoned. That's a lot of sin. If it was only my sin that he came to pay for, that's a lot of sin. Thank God his grace is sufficient. He covered every one of them. Oh, I like the song, Grace Greater Than My Sin. Man, what a tremendous thought that is. I think we'll sing that in a few minutes, Brother Luke. A grace greater than our sin. All right, let's have a word of prayer this morning, and then we'll hear from the choir. And we have a few things we want to do a little bit different this morning. We'll get to that in a few minutes. And as we pray together, I'd like you to do a couple things for me. We have missionaries tonight of this church that some of them right now are in services and uh, getting ready to preach, and we need to pray for those services. Uh, Brother Shinneberry specifically asked that we pray for his son, Mike, who's a pastor over in the west side of the state, and uh, he's starting his missions conference this morning, and so let's make sure we pray about that. But then as I pray this morning, would you just join with me, and in the quietness of your heart, would you ask the Lord to please lead in this service and then be glorified in our faith missions commitments this morning. If you'll do that and join with me, I'd, I'd be so grateful for that, okay? So let's bow together. I'll lead in prayer, and you join me as we pray. Father, thank you for another chance to assemble just like this. Father, thank you for the wonderful week we've had together. Uh, the preaching has been, Lord, such a help and a blessing. And then God, I thank you again for the report last night that we saw together about all that you did last year. And God, we anticipate great things this year through faith missions. Lord, I do pray that you'd be with the services going on right now in different parts of our country, but then also, Lord, in other places in this world. Some Sunday services have already taken place. God, whatever the case may be, would you please use the, 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 your word to make it effectual and powerful. 
in the hearts of those that will be listening to the preaching. God, we do pray for Brother Mike Shinneberry in that conference this week. Please give him wisdom and encourage him in that church. And then, Lord, would you please, please take everything this morning. God, would you please, you be the conductor. God, would you just orchestrate everything to where it fits your perfect will. God, please be high and lifted up through it all. We'll thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated as the choir sings this morning. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but has given us the strength to
Thank you. Choir, would you please stand with us? Brother Leonard, thank you for your help with the choir in the last couple of weeks and Brother Dowdy's absence. Stand with us, please. The choir is going to find their seats this morning. Remember, children, you're going to stay right in the auditorium this morning. There are no junior church classes, so you stay right, right with us. Grab a sermon note sheet, kids, if you didn't get one already. And uh, you move around just a little bit, shake hands with somebody, pretend like you're happy to see them, and the choir is going to find their seats. All right. church uh, for a couple of years now in one way or another. Um, Miss Haley stopped by. Has it been a couple of years ago the first time you came? Is it, okay, a couple of years. Come on up here. Uh, a couple of years ago she stopped by and um, kind of got to know her a little bit then and uh, then she disappeared for a little while. When she came that time she was single. When she came back a little while later she was, she was married and um, they've, been, they've been so faithful. 
in the time that they've been right. in our church. And we're, they've, they've, I think they're the newest members of our church. They just joined the church formally a few weeks ago. And we're so thankful to have them. Uh, Brother Daniel is a part of the, the armed forces. And uh, we're live streaming, so I'm not going to say everything that we could say about it. But he is getting ready to be deployed uh, for a year. And he'll be going, well, how long have you all been married? Almost a year. And so I'm concerned that you didn't know the answer to that, brother. And it's, <laughs> it's not even been a year. <laughs> he looks at her like, oh, almost a year? <laughs> at least you didn't say, is it five years? Because that, that doesn't come across well either, but. Anyway, he's getting ready to go away for a little while, and uh, some of the folks in the church, Miss Shelley Zimmerman came to me a few weeks ago with a wonderful idea. We want to make sure we, we love on this couple and we, we take care of them. And so what many of you folks have done is um, you have chipped in, and we are sending Brother Daniel overseas with two gift bags full of gift cards. And uh, the base he'll be stationed at, he, what a world we live in where you can still use Amazon and have things delivered uh, way, way over in the part of the world where you're being at. And so we want to make sure we send them away. And I don't know how else to tell them that we love them other than to give them uh, these, these gifts. And uh, these are flowers I picked this morning from my flower garden, Miss Haley. And um, I want to pray for you all right now. And uh, we want to ask the Lord to keep you safe and to provide for you while you guys are, are, are apart. And he'll be gracious. His grace is so sufficient. And you're going to prove that to be so in the next few months. And uh, we're honored and thankful for your service and for all that you do for us. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful for every sacrifice that's been made by a soldier for our country. And my God, when it's someone who's in our church, it sure is a, a much more personal thing. And God, I pray that you put your hand of protection on Daniel. And God, as he leaves this place today, we won't see him for some time. And God, I pray that you would go with him. And God, would you keep him safe? But then also, Father, I pray that you would preserve his testimony. And God, would you use him to be a help and a blessing in someone's life? And then, God, I pray that you'd be with Miss Haley. God, would you keep her encouraged and comforted as they're apart? And then, Lord, I pray that you would make their reunion in a few months. God, would you make it very sweet and precious. And we'll thank you for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you give them a big round of applause, please? I love you all very, very much. All right, we're praying for you. Love you. Watch your steps. Nothing would make this any more awkward than you falling down the steps. All right, ushers, as soon as you guys are all set, why don't you come with those offering plates? I do have a couple of announcements I need to breeze through very, very quickly. We will be periodically mentioning Brother Daniel's name to remind us to be praying for him. And so you ought to take it just as serious as you can if that was your son or your daughter going off for your deployment. You ought to, you ought to pray for them just as fervently as you wish everybody else would pray for your son or your daughter. Just a couple more announcements very, very quickly. Uh, this Saturday is a crazy busy Saturday. How many of you guys are ready for a break? It has been, a, it's been a, just a whirlwind of a couple of months. Uh, this Saturday, there is play practice, and then there's also a ladies' meeting at Parkview Baptist Church, and if you're already signed up for that, then you know those details. If you need clarification on any of those details, you can see my wife, Melody, and uh, she can tell you where to be, when to be there, and all of that um, for uh, the ladies' meeting at Parkview Baptist out in Livonia. And then uh, later on that evening is the annual hymn fest at Loomis Park Baptist Church just over in Jackson, and every year we try to take a good showing of people over there it's really it's an enjoyable time to get together and just spend an hour singing hymns and hearing testimonies those kinds of things um we're, we've not organized a big group to go this year i have announced it a couple of times and so if you'd like to go over there i'm, I'm going to do my best to be there as well uh, but there's a lot going on on saturday and so if you don't make it i understand but it would be a huge blessing to brother uh, 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 zawatsky if uh, if you could be there and just add to that crowd a little bit normally we take a, a large portion of our choir typically there's 30 to 35 people of our choir that go and help out and that's that's usually the bulk of the choir and we're not doing that this year and i feel kind of bad about that uh, but if you can go and just uh, help support that that uh, gathering just by being there for the for the hymn sing itself that would be a help to them and then um Next Sunday morning is the Easter play. I understand it's Palm Sunday. I know all of that, but we're taking the Easter, the, the Sunday morning service. It'll be the Easter play. There is no 10 o'clock hour. There's no, no Sunday schools next Sunday morning. And everything will start right at 11 o'clock with the Easter play. And so make sure you get here. Don't complain about get, not getting a good seat if you don't show up until five minutes till 11, all right? So if you want a good seat, make sure you come early and get the seat that you want, all right? And then I'm very excited about this. Um, I have worked, Brother 
Patterson more this week than I normally work a guest preacher. Uh, he has preached for us Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, he's preaching this morning, he's preaching this evening, and then this afternoon I've asked him if he would be the speaker for the Thoroughly Furnished Ministries, and I am excited that he's uh, willing to do that. It's going to be a great, a great class. And so all of the regular Thoroughly Furnished students are going to be there, um, but I'm opening up to anyone else that wants to come, come and take part in that class. Uh, he will be speaking on cross cultural evangelization or evangelism, and it's going to be a help to you. I promise it's going to be a help to you. And uh, if you want to come be a part of that, I would encourage you to do so. It's at 315, and uh, you come, and um, if you're going to come, maybe give me a heads up, shoot me, shoot me a text, or let Brother Wyvern or myself know so we know how to plan. Uh, but uh, if you want to come be a part of that, I, I'd, I'd be thrilled for you too. It'd be time well spent. And then there, I, there is no choir practice. And so many of you are going to say, why don't we just bump uh, TFM back uh, a little bit later. We can't do that because some of the TFM students come from other churches that are a distance away, and they can't come to TFM and make it back to their church if we don't start at 315. So we're going to keep TFM at 315 and no choir practice, uh, uh, prayer meeting at 530, service at 6 this evening, okay? If you have questions about any of that thing I just said, maybe I completely messed it up, I don't know, you can text me, and I'll give you all of those details. All right? We're going to ask the blessing on the offering this morning. Brother Stark has the microphone, and then Miss Patterson is going to play the offertory for us this morning. Brother Stark, you go right ahead. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day to gather in the house of the Lord on this Faith Mission Sunday. And uh, we know with, uh, with Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday coming up, there may be visitors here, and, and some of us have uh, extended family members that are here that uh, we have a chance for, for uh, to hear the gospel and lead souls to Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Ms. Patterson. Musicians, I think we're finished this morning. We're going to turn it over to Brother Patterson in just a moment. Uh, she, that, that's an arrangement that Ms. Patterson wrote, and some of you are not familiar with the, <clears throat> the hymn, The Sands of Time Are Sinking. And um, I, I'm not sure, maybe someone can help me later. In our hymn book, it's page 779B. I'm guessing 779A is the Star Spangled Banner. I'm not sure what the correlation is, but my, my favorite verses of the whole song, and I haven't heard it in, in many years, um, is verses 4 and 5. It says, Oh, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He brings a poor, vile sinner into his house of wine. I stand upon his merit. I know no other stand, not even where glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's hand. And I love this one, last verse. The bride eyes not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. I will not gaze at glory, but on my king of grace. Not at the crown he giveth, but on his pierced hand. The lamb is all the glory of Emmanuel's land. It's a powerful, powerful words. Thank you, Miss Patterson, for that song. Brother Patterson, you know where you're at now. You make yourself right at home. We look forward to hearing from you this Amen. morning. Thank you so much. This has been such a wonderful time. My wife and I have enjoyed this conference immensely. My wife and I have also enjoyed all of the many, many ways in which you have made us feel at home. Thank you for allowing us to stay down at Paradise Lodge downstairs. <laughs> Uh, that has got to be one of the most comfortable places we ever stay. We've now been here twice, and we certainly do enjoy it. My wife told me yesterday morning that she's decided she'd like to move to a church basement. Uh, down, down below, you know, where it's all quiet and calm and dark, and uh, it's just been fantastic. We've rested like never before. Pastor was talking about trying to put me through a, a mill grind here. This has been so nice. Uh, normally when I preach in conferences, I'm in Hispanic churches, and Pastor Summer, sometimes I preach as often as six times a day. So to come here and only preach once a day, I felt a little bit backslidden, but it's been fantastic. I've really enjoyed all the backsliding, and um, thank you so much for having such an easy schedule. I really do mean that, and uh, we've, just, we've just been so grateful. Uh, thanks to all of those who have uh, just made us feel welcome. I mean, really, really welcome. I had a lady come up this morning and gave me all these kisses, and uh, just uh, I was shocked by that, but uh, I, I'm still grateful. And so, uh, yeah, I met, felt right at home. I ate one of them, um, but... Um, that's been good. And thank you all for uh, all the wonderful food uh, that so many of you have prepared. I enjoyed going through the dessert line yesterday and uh, the, the, the chicken, the hummus, the pita. Uh, goodness gracious, that was amazing. And then pastors taking me to all these fancy restaurants. I, I really appreciate that. It wasn't necessary, pastor, but keep up the good work. And uh, so it's, it's just been great. He, he did ask me if I'd like to go to his home for a sandwich, and I, I didn't get to do that. I asked for a peanut butter and jelly, but one of the church people yesterday uh, brought me a, a, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and boy, did I enjoy that last night. So uh, just so many ways, and I just want to say thank you. 1 Timothy chapter number 1, 1 Timothy 1, we're going to begin reading in verse number 12, 1 Timothy 1, verse number 12, and I'll read through verse number 17. 1 Timothy chapter number 1, verses 12 through 17. The Bible says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Heavenly Father, would you please be honored and glorified through the service.
service this morning. Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and help us to understand the truth of your word. And I pray that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would engage our minds and that you would show us the areas in which we need to perhaps make changes in and of ourselves. Lord, without you, we can do nothing. We believe, Lord, that you have a particular perfect plan for our life, and so we commit ourselves in the service into your hands, asking for your will to be done. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Have you ever wondered why it is that God saved you? Why God saved me? With over right at 8 billion people in the world, and according to some of the most generous statistics, most likely less than 2, 3% of that large group that have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, who are we? Why are we so special? Who, who are we that God would look down from heaven to earth and, and would consider us and would allow us to come to hear this wonderful news of salvation that we might be saved and our lives might be changed when so many others have never heard. Someone perhaps would answer and say, well, it's because God loved us. And perhaps you're reminded of that verse in John chapter 3 where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And you would be correct. You see, it is because of God's love towards us that he has saved us. There is a phrase that I've memorized in several different languages, and it's the phrase, God loves you. In Hindi, Prabhu Parmeshwara Kopyar Kartahe. In Telugu, Dievuru Mimulunu Premotsutsunaru. In Thai, Prajao Rugtan. In Mongolian, Borhan Tan Thayerte. In Russian, Bok Lyubit Tebya. In Romanian, Dumnezeu Te Yubishte. In Ukrainian, Bog Lyubit Tebe. In Chinese, Shangdi Oini. In Nahuatl of Mexico, Totatin Mitsniki. In Mixtec, Diosiki Eva Indra Shindra Yo. In Hebrew, Elohimo Hebotcha. In Greek, Theos Agapa Su. In Maya, Dios Nohoch Tukani, Diosu Yakumaech. In Mam of Guatemala, Akman Dios Inchkontea. In Quichua of South America, Dios Cantacuyan. In German, Gottlieb Dick. In Italian, Dio Tiama. In Catalan, Deo Te Estima. In Spanish, Dios Te Ama. In French, Dios se me vous. In English, God loves you. Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ loved us enough that he came to this earth to die on a cross so that we could be saved. And just in the same way that God has a specific purpose in having given us life, God has a specific purpose in giving us eternal life and salvation. One of the greatest goals, one of the greatest joys is when you and I come to know what God's will is for our life and then we fulfill that will. We accomplish his purposes. God has a perfect will that includes every aspect of my life. One of the greatest joys is just knowing and doing his will. There's only two reactions that we can have to his will. We can either be disobedient or we can be obedient. This morning, I would like to show you from our text that God has three specific purposes in mind for which he saves us. Number one, God saved us so he can change us. God saved us so he can change us. Now, many people think that they need to change before they go to God. They need to change before they can get saved, and it doesn't work that way. You can't, first of all, change or rehabilitate yourself or reform yourself and make yourself worthy of being saved. No, the Bible says that while we were still in our sins, 
God loved us. While we were still in our sins, Jesus Christ paid the price for our, our sin debt. And so God saves us so that he can change us. Go with me, please, to our text, and we're going to begin looking here in verse number 13. Paul writes about his prior life, and he says, Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious? He says, I was a blasphemer. What is blasphemy? Blasphemy is attributing to God the things that the devil does and attributing to the devil the things that God does. Do you remember in the book of Job where Job's wife comes to Job and after the devil had brought about all of this destruction and, and his children had died and his, his cattle had died and his camels and, and even his donkeys, I mean, he lost everything. And she comes to Job and she says, Job, curse God and die. That would have been blasphemy. To attribute to God something that the devil had specifically done to destroy all that Job had. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans, chapter number 12, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed unto this world, but be, ye listen to this, transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God saved us to transform us. He wants to change us. He takes a sinner that's still in sin. He takes that man. He cleans him up. He prepares him. He equips him. He, he trains him. And then he puts him into the ministry. The Bible says not only was Paul a blasphemer, he was a persecutor. He hated Christians. He wanted to see the death of Christians. He would do anything he could to, to hurt Christians. Maybe right now you're thinking of someone you know. Maybe you're thinking of someone who absolutely hates you because you're a Christian. Maybe you're thinking of someone who has uh, cursed you because you're a Christian. Maybe you're thinking of someone who has mistreated you because you're a Christian. Now I want you to look in your mind of faith at that particular person and think about what God would have to do in the life of that person to change them to the level that one day they could stand behind this wonderful pulpit and preach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ. That's what Paul did. That's what God did in the Apostle Paul's life. There is no one on earth that deserves to stand behind a pulpit like this. It is not of my merit or anyone else's merit that we should stand here and preach the Word of God. It is only because God saved us so that He could change us. Oh, how He loves to change us. His grace can change us in ways we cannot imagine. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 20, For you are bought with a price. Wherefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You see, God saves us because He wants to change us. That's why God saved me. Now, you and I have to acknowledge our sinfulness. We have to recognize just how bad we are. There's a book written by a man by the name of Buell KZ who wrote this. The holiness of the prodigal son lay in his sense of sinfulness. The sin of the boy at home lay in his sense of of righteousness. You see, the prodigal son was made holy and righteous because he was aware of his deep and terrible sinfulness. While that older son was rejected because although he had stayed at home, he had done so in a sense of pride and self righteousness. Oh, my friend, we're nothing. What does God use to change us? Well, the Bible says in verse number 13, but I obtained mercy. 
You know, when, when the Apostle Paul uses this phrase, I obtain mercy, he's really talking about the moment of salvation. You will not find in the Bible that anyone says, I accepted Christ as my Savior. I accepted Christ into my heart. I was gloriously saved. We don't find it said in those words. What we find is the Apostle Paul writing in verse 13 and then again down again in verse number 16 where he says, I obtained mercy. That's the way he describes his moment of salvation. And so God uses mercy, but not only mercy. Look, please, in verse number 14. The Bible says in verse number 14, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, of our Lord, was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. God uses mercy. God uses grace. God uses love. God uses faith. And he begins to work and to change and to mold and to make us into the people that he wants us to be because God saved us to change us. Can I tell you just to what level God wants to change us? Look at back at verse number 12. Oh, this is a wonderful verse. It says, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. In Daniel chapter number 5 and verse number 27, the Bible says concerning King Nebuchadnezzar, thou art weighed in the balances and have been found wanting. You're wanting. Nebuchadnezzar, you, you don't add up. You're, you're not enough. You're, you're wanting. But then when, when Paul writes about himself, he says that God counted him Faithful. Do you know what happened here in this amazing uh, uh, arithmetic that can only be explained by faith? Here's what happened. God started adding up everything in Paul's life, all the good things. And preacher, let's just be honest, it was a really small sum. But then, then he added in all the bonus points, okay? The bonus points of being in Christ, and all of a sudden, those bonus points were enough to shoot Paul way over the total amount that he needed, and he was counted faithful. You see, it's not because you and I are so good. It's because of the bonus points we get in Christ Jesus that all of a sudden we qualify to do things that in our own right and in our own strength and in our own ability we would never be able to do because Jesus Christ saves us to change us. He wants to make us and equip us and enable us in ways that we cannot do for ourselves. And so here we find the whole reason why Jesus Christ came to this earth, according to verse number 15, was to save sinners, just like Paul. And then Paul writes by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, of whom I am chief. He says, I'm the worst sinner that's ever lived. Listen, if Jesus Christ saved Paul and changed Paul, he can change you. You may be here today and you'd say, Brother Bill, I don't think I can live another day in my sin. Brother Bill, I don't think I can continue forward. Brother Bill, I'm ready to give up. I've got great news for you. Jesus Jesus Christ wants to save you. I was preaching this message at a little church down in Pachuca, Mexico. There was a guy standing back in the back. He was standing there during the whole service. He was watching me intently. He, he had his eyes fastened on me. When I finished preaching and stepped down, he, he waved at me and asked me to come back, and I went back to the back. Pastor Summers, when I got back there, he said, he said uh, do you really think God can change me? I said, yes, I do. He said, are you absolutely sure God can change me? I said, yes, I am. He said, let me tell you something. He said, this afternoon I was at home. I pulled out my pistol. I loaded it up. He said, I was planning to take my life right then. My wife was out of the house. I was about to take that gun. I was going to take my life. He said, and all of a sudden I heard my wife at the door and I knew I couldn't do it with her there. And so I took the gun. I put it down inside of a drawer. I put a book on top of it and I covered it up. When she came in, she said, you've got to come to me, come with me to church tonight. He said, I don't want to. She said, no, you've got to come with me to church tonight. He said, I don't want to. She said, look, you come with me to church tonight. I'll cook you any meal you want. I'll do anything you want. Please come to church with me tonight. And he said, okay, I'll come to church with you. He said, I came in tonight and I heard you talking about God being able to change lives. He said, you really think God can change my life? Because if not, I'm going home and I'm going to do what I'd planned to do. I said, yes, sir, I do believe God can change your life. He fell down on his knees right there in front of me. We started praying. He started begging God that God would save him. 
It was only a few seconds later and his wife came running up behind us and she tackled him and grabbed him and hugged him. You know why Jesus saved us? Because he is able and he wants to change us. That's why God saves us, number one. Number two, why did God save me? So that others can be saved. Look please at verse number 16. Paul writes this, how be it for this cause. Okay, now when the Bible says for this cause, it's like for this reason, th this is why, okay, for this cause I obtained mercy. This is why God saved me. Now notice, watch this, that in me first Jesus might show forth all long suffering. The, the first is so that he could change me. God wanted to change me. That's why he saved me. He wanted to change me. But why did he want to change me? Watch this. For a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Why did God save me? To change me. But secondly, so that others could be saved. Do you realize that the reason that God saved you was not just so that he could change you, so that he could put you in a church, so that he could put a Bible under your arm, so that he could put a song in your heart, so that he could be able to change you? No, that's not all. The, the work's not done right then. Oh, yes, that's a wonderful first step, but that's just the first step. You see, the second step is he wants other people to be saved because of you. Paul said to the Philippian jailer, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thine house. See, it was never God's intention for someone to be saved, and then that's it. That's the end of the road. That's all it goes. That's as far as it goes. No, no, no. God intended for us to be saved so that others can be saved. Now, this week, we're in the middle of a missions conference, and one of the parts of a missions conference is that this church is going to send out missionaries and support missions projects and support the Word of God going out. And why is that? So that others can be saved. Here in a little while, you're going to come, and you're going to uh, hand in a little card, and you're going to make a commitment to God, not to this church, to God. We're not asking for your name. We don't even have a place for your name on this card. And you're going to make a commitment to God that you're going to be a part of trying to help the gospel to reach around the world because God has given us the responsibility of seeing other people saved. <coughs> God saved me to change me, but he wants others to be saved. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 1, Paul writes, Brother, in my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. See, my life is a pattern so that other people can be saved. My, my testimony, uh, I, I, this transformation is proof that God can do this. Several years ago, I was on a flight from Bogota, Colombia down to Bucaramanga. When I got on that flight, I had risen early that morning. I'd already read my Bible. But when I got on the plane, I thought, you know, I'm going to have about an hour here, I, I should probably, I could pull my Bible out and I can read it some more here on the plane. And so there were people coming down the aisle, and I, I prefer to sit on the aisle myself, Pastor, okay? I don't like that middle seat. I'm kind of a big guy. I don't know if y'all have noticed. And, uh, and so I was there on the aisle, and this very nicely dressed lady was walking down the aisle. She looked at me, and she said, excuse me, sir, uh, that place in the middle is, is my place. And I said, oh, well, perfect. So I stood up so that she could sit down. While she was standing, I went ahead and grabbed my Bible out of my my, uh, my suitcase, my little rollie that was up, up top. And, and then I sat back down. And she was over there, you know, fixing her purse and all this stuff. She looked like a business lady. She was one of those ladies that had like 17 bags, you know. And uh, she's trying to get everything arranged. And uh, you, you, you've probably seen people like that. And, uh, and then all of a sudden she turned around and she saw me and she screamed. She said, ah! She said, you're a pastor. I said, uh, yes, ma'am. And then she started just weeping. And she said, can you help me? I said, well, uh, yes, ma'am. She said, I need Jesus. Boy, that's not the way it normally happens, is it, Pastor? I've led several people to Christ throughout my life. 
But that's the only time I've ever had somebody just break down weeping, saying, I need Jesus. And okay, I opened up my Bible. I started showing her several verses. She just, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Just crying the whole way through. I asked her if she'd like to pray. Oh, yes, yes. She prayed. Oh, my goodness. She was just, I mean, she's a mess. She's a mess. Mascara running down in all the different varieties and the shades and the colors. It looked like a Picasso painting. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so I, I, I gave her some time, and, and she sat over there, and, and, and when she finished crying, she kind of pulled herself together, and she said, can I tell you something? And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I, I was the pastor of a Pentecostal church for 18 years. And I never once believed the Bible. I was told that if I'd become a pastor, I'd make a lot of money. And I became famous. And I preached in conferences all over my country, but even in other countries. And I wrote books. And, and I was very famous, but I never believed any of it. She said, uh, she said, and after 18 years, I decided I'd had enough of living that way. And, and I decided I was just going to leave the church. And I got all away from it. And, and uh, I pulled you know, my daughter out as well. And, and she said, but six months ago, my daughter went to this church. And she heard the gospel. And she's been telling me for the last six months that the Bible's real. And that Jesus Christ does want to save people. And that, that he really does exist. And, and she's been begging me to get saved. She said, and this morning on the way to the airport, my daughter drove me to the airport and she was crying and asking me to please get saved and that God wanted to change my life. And, and she was just begging me to get saved. And I told her, no, I told her, no. And, 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 and she said, but mom, if the plane falls and, and you die, you're going to hell. Mom, the Bible's real. God doesn't want you to die and go to hell. Mom, please get saved. And she said, look, if God is real, then let him put a pastor on the plane next to me. Then I'll believe and I'll get saved. She said, and when I got up and I looked over at you reading your Bible, I thought, oh my goodness, God does exist and I need this. And he's giving me one more chance. And I thought, I better do this quick before he changes his mind. See, God saves me to change me. But also so that others can be saved. See, that, that's why he saved me. Oh, but that's not where it ends. Look at verse number 17. The Bible says in verse number 17, Now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I don't know what you think, but I believe that God is worthy of our praise. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 9, the Bible says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, God saved me first to change me, yes, but so that others can be saved. Now watch this, so that he can be praised. Because he's worthy of praise. He deserves praise. He wants praise. He wants us to praise him. But the way he gets praised is when he saves me and he changes me. And now other people get saved. And those people are, in, are, are, are invested in seeing yet other people be saved. And then all of a sudden he gets praise and he gets glory. And he's worthy of it. That's why the Bible says now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. He alone is the king of kings and Lord of lords. He alone is eternal, immortal, invisible, and the only wise God. He alone is worthy of all honor and glory for all of eternity because of what he's done in my life and because of what he's done in your life and because of what he wants to do in other people's lives all over the world. And he lets you and me be a little part of what he's doing to reach the world with the truth and the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And as you and I come before him and we honor him and we bow before him and we submit ourselves before him he says oh boy this is great this is going to be good watch what I can do watch what I can do Amen. you know what the only impediment to all this is my sin That's it. my sin 
Watch this. If I sin, he can't change me. When I sin, other people don't get saved. When I sin, he doesn't get praised. You know what's keeping us today from seeing a massive movement of God reaching out and souls being saved and churches being started? Quite honestly, the problem's not in the White House or in Congress. It's in the hearts of Christians who have harbored sin and we're not able to see God do what he wants to in our life. See, the Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs that whoso covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh his sins shall find mercy. Oh, there's that word again. What do you know? That word mercy. You see, God wants us to be saved so that he can change us, so that others can be saved, so that he can be praised. In 2000, I had the privilege of going to Africa. I was in the country of Ghana, and I went to a town, a little small town called Trubadum. It was the first time I'd ever been in Thrubadum. As a matter of fact, it was the first time that there had ever been a gospel preaching service in the town of Thrubadum. We had arrived early in the morning. We were going out soul winning. And uh, uh, I, I was with uh, my translator. And you go up to a house. And uh, uh, when you walk up to the house, you see that there's no door there. There's just a doorway. And uh, you don't ask for permission. You just walk on in. And you look for a place to sit, and you sit down. And that's the custom there, preacher. You, you don't ring a doorbell. You just go in. And so I, we went in, and we sat down. And this lady came out, and she began to speak to us in the Chui language. And she said, Akwaba. And we responded. Akwaba means welcome. We responded, and we said, Ya'ason. And then she, said, she asked us, why have you come and I told her, I have come with a message from God for you and your family. And she said, oh, that's wonderful. She said, did you bring the money? And I thought about how to answer that question. And I said, well, the Lord didn't say anything about money, but why did you ask? And she said, well, this morning I was praying and I told God that if he existed, I wanted him to send me some money. Three months ago, my husband died, and his family is blaming me for his death. They think I poisoned him. I didn't. She said, but now they're talking about wanting to kill me, and, and, and I'm, I'm scared. And so I was thinking that maybe I should get some money and go buy some special medicine and give it to my three children so that they can die, and then I'll take it and I'll die, and then wherever he is, I can be with him. And I said, well, God doesn't want you to die. God wants you to live. And she said, well, why would he want that? And I said, because he wants to do some great things in your family's life. And she said, wow, like what? And I said, well, first of all, he wants to save you. And so I explained salvation to her, and she got saved that day. I went back 17 years later. By the time I came back to Trubadum, they had a church. Oh, it was a simple little building. But on that day, there were about 200 people there, and I preached, and oh, I had a great time. I'd kind of forgotten about the first time I'd been there and meeting that particular lady. After the service, I stood in the back, and I was shaking hands, and many people filed by. There was a lady that was waiting off to one side, and she suddenly came up at the very end, and she said, do you remember me? And I said, well, I'm not sure have we met? And she said, yes, you came to my home 17 years ago, and you told me that God wanted to save me because he wanted to do something special in my family. And I said, yes, ma'am, I do remember that. I said, I think I remember you had three children. And she called out, and she called her, her kids to her. By this time, they were all in their late teens and early 20s. And she said, these are my three children. She said, these are my two daughters, and this is my son. She said, uh, I just wanted to say thank you. My, my three children have now been saved. My, my daughters are serving the Lord here in our church. She said, and, and I want you to know that my son 
is in Bible college. He's preparing to be a preacher. Why did God save me so that he could change me, so that others can be saved, so that he can be praised? Heavenly Father, I thank you and I bless your name for what you have done in my life and what you have done in so many other lives in allowing us to know Jesus Christ as our Savior so that our life can be changed. But Lord, today as we're in the middle of this conference, we also remember that there are many who still need to be saved. And Lord, we're asking and we're praying and we're begging you that you would allow us to have a part in seeing those souls come to you. Oh, Heavenly Father, we desire this because we truly believe that you are worthy of all honor and all praise. Lord, would you please speak to our hearts today? How many here today would say, Brother Bill, I still remember that day when I got saved. I still remember when Jesus Christ looked down from heaven and he gave me salvation. I'm so grateful for it. Could you raise your hand as a testimony of your salvation all over the auditorium? Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Now, maybe you're here today and you'd say, you know, I couldn't raise my hand. I I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure I would spend eternity with Christ in heaven, but I would sure love to know that for sure. I'd like to know that Jesus Christ is my Savior. I'd like to know that I'm on my way to heaven. And you'd say, please pray for me. I need God to change me. You'd say, please pray for me. I need to be saved. Would you slip up your hand? No one's looking but me, but I'd like to pray for you. How many here this morning would say, please pray for me. I need to be saved. I want Jesus Christ to be my Savior. Please pray for me. Would you raise your hand? I'd like to pray for you. I won't embarrass you, but I would like to pray for you. Now, maybe you're here this morning and you said, Brother Bill, I've been saved, but up till now, my life hasn't really been too involved in seeing other people saved, but I realize that's God's purpose for me, and I want to get involved in seeing other people saved. You'd say, would you pray for me that God would help me to lead others to him and be involved in the salvation of others. Would you please pray for me? Would you raise your hand? I'd like to pray for you. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Many, many hands. Amen. God bless you. Now, maybe you're here today and you'd say, Brother Bill, there's some sin in my life and I know I've allowed it to be there. But the fact is, is I recognize that that sin is an impediment. It's a big obstacle to what God wants to do. And you'd say, please pray for me. I need to take care of some things today. Would you raise your hand? I'd like to pray for you. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being honest. Amen. Amen. Could I ask everyone to please stand? We call this time a time of invitation. And what we're inviting you to do is to leave your place and make your way here to the front to this altar. And if there's an area in your life that needs to be made right before God, or maybe there's a request that you have, something you know that you need to pray about, as our sister begins to play this hymn of invitation, would you just leave your place right now and make your way here to the front? Make your way up and just spend some time in prayer with God. And whatever it is that he's shown you that you need to do, would you just be faithful to talk to him about it? Maybe today you're, you're just coming because you need God's help in your life. Maybe it's not because of any particular sin, but you recognize that maybe you're facing a decision or, or some, something going on and, and you need to spend time with God. Maybe your prayer is that you just want to see other people saved. Maybe you've been saved, but you haven't been scripturally baptized. And you just believe that God would have you to be obedient to him in that area. Would you come up and would you spend the time in prayer and then make sure you let Pastor Summers know of your decision. Whatever that is, let's look to the Lord in this time of prayer. Pastor. The altar is being used this morning by many people, and maybe you ought to be at the altar with them. It's time for you to come. In just a few minutes, we'll be collecting our faith missions cards. It might be a great idea to use the altar this morning to one more time seek the Lord's will in your life regarding faith missions giving. I invite you to come. Brother Luke, what page? 611 in our hymn book, Take My Life and Let It Be. That's a great song to end this morning with. Page 611. I'm thrilled to see young people at the altar. It's wonderful to recognize the Spirit of God working on someone's heart. 
to the point of submission. It's wonderful. 611, let's sing it together on that first verse. Bow your heads, please, and stand quietly right where you are. Some at the altar praying. They can take their time this morning. There's still time for you to come. Two young people came to me earlier in the week. I forget which service it was. They said, Pastor Summers, we just want you to know that I, I told the Lord, I just want to serve him, and I did what you did. And I told him I'm his if he wants me. That's wonderful. Wonderful. God doesn't just call young people. He doesn't just call children. It's a very good possibility there's adults standing right here this morning that God's been, that God's been prodding your heart maybe for years. When are you going to just surrender to him? Faith Mission Sunday of 2024 would be a great time to do that. We're going to sing one more verse. If nobody comes, we'll end the invitation. Let's sing that fourth verse together. The fourth verse all together. I want you, everybody to find page 611 in your book. I, I want to sing that last verse a cappella. This is one of the most beautiful songs to sing a cappella as a congregation. I love it. And so Miss Beck is going to get us started on the piano, and then and she'll just drop out. Sing that last verse from your heart this morning. singing. Thank you. You can be seated. This is Faith Mission Sunday, and so we have talked about it for the last several weeks. We have spent so much time praying about this Sunday, not because of this day, but because of what this day represents. And this is the day that will renew our 2024 missions commitments. And so if you're a part of Faith Baptist Church, you certainly know what this is about. If you've just been with us a little while, hopefully by now you understand. I'd like you to take out your Faith Missions cards. I've got mine. I've been carrying this one with me now for I don't know how long. I've got it. It's kind of all bent up and weathered. I've spent a lot of time praying with this card in front of me. And on this card represents what I believe the Lord have my wife and I and my children do this year as the Summers family. I hope you've got yours filled out. If you don't have one but you'd like one, uh, there are cards there in the, the little card holder in the pew in front of you. If there are no more there but you still need one, would you hold your hand up? We'll make sure we get you one. Anybody at all need one that does not have one? Right back here in the very center. Brother North, would you help me? I just lost who it was, but they'll raise their hand again. 
Raise your hand and we'll get you. Anyone else not have one but would like to have one? All right, let me give instructions on how to fill this out. Um, it's not complicated, but every year someone raises serious concerns. We don't want you to fill out every spot on the card. We just want you to fill out the spot that describes what you're doing. All right, some people would like to give weekly. If you want to give towards missions weekly, just write the number in there, and that's all you have to do. If you give monthly instead of weekly, then just write in the amount there where it says per month, and that's all you have to do. If you're just going to say by the end of the year, this is how much I'm going to have given, and then write that number right here, and then that's all you have to do. What you do not have to do is write a number in the top and then add it to a number in the middle and then add it to a number in the bottom because that makes it look like you just committed to give like $200,000. All right, so let's not do that. Figure out which one of those spots describes what you're going to do. As Brother Patterson said, there's no place for your name. We don't send an invoice or a bill or a late notice. We don't know. There's no place for your name on here. This is just so we know how to budget for the coming year. And all that we discussed last night in our missions, it's only possible. It's only possible uh, through the faithful faith missions giving of, the, of uh, Faith Baptist Church. All right, ushers, come on with those offering plates. Uh, this is how we're going to collect these cards. Melody, can you sing this morning? Why don't you come get ready to sing, if you would, please? And I just dropped those cards in the offering plate. And um, officially, next Sunday will be the first Sunday of Faith Missions Giving um, for 2024. And so I guess, technically speaking, this is the last Sunday you can give for 2023. Uh, So just put your cards in the offering plate at this time, and uh, we'll get those things all added up. And then if you want to know how much uh, was committed, then you'll have to come to church tonight. Um, Not stay at home and watch the live stream, because I may have them turn the live stream off. Just to incentivize attendance at church tonight. All right. <laughs> Brother Stark here. Brother Stark. All right. I, uh, I don't know how each family does things. Everyone's different. And uh, we had a family meeting. I can't remember if it was last night or the night before. And I went around the room. And at each of my kids, they do their own, they own their own faith missions giving. And Melody and I do ours uh, together. And um, from, from our youngest to the oldest, um, they're involved in faith missions giving. And I didn't ask the older ones what, what, what their commitments were, but I am so encouraged by, by young people who many times, who many times respond to, in faith, they respond in faith so much better than adults. And I'm, I'm just encouraged by it. I would encourage you children, get involved, but you need to let your mom and dad know. Don't do anything without mom and dad's knowledge. You get their permission and, and they'll pray with you about it. And let's join together as a church, young and old. Let's join together as a church and see what God will do in the year 2024. Amen. Lord, thank you for another opportunity to commit to you just a small portion of what you've committed to our trust. God, I pray that you would help us be good stewards with our money. And then, God, I pray that you would once again give very clear direction and strong guidance in each of our lives as we try to plan and commit uh, for the coming year. God, be glorified by not just the amount, but by the motive and the attitude of the giving. God, find us to be those cheerful givers that you love. Well, thank you for this, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. been looking back along this winding road to the old familiar markers of the mercies I have known. I know it may sound simple, but it's more than a cliche. There's no better
Let's stand together. He's been good, hadn't he, church? He's been good. Thank you, Melody. Thank you all so much for your faithfulness this week. It's been a, it's been a long week for many of you with play practices and so much going on during the week. Thank you for being here. I sure do appreciate it. Would you come back this afternoon? Of course, uh, Thrilly Furnished Ministries, the Biblical Studies class will be at 3.15. And Dr. Patterson will be speaking in that. I hope you'll come be a part of that. And then uh, we'll have prayer meeting at 5.30 and uh, service at 6. That's the last thing, service at 6. All right. I love you very much. Brother Jenkins, come on up here. I want you to dismiss us in prayer. You'll be in prison tonight. Okay. <laughs> He's preaching in Jackson Prison uh, this evening, and uh, always great things come of that. Brother Jenkins, would you dismiss us in prayer this morning, please, sir? I love you. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you again for the week that you've uh, given us, Lord, the just a great fellowship, Lord, and the meaning behind all the face promise giving, Lord, and the missions week, Lord. We just love you. Lord, we thank you and praise you for what this church has been able to do over the last year. Lord, we're excited to see what we're going to be able to do, Lord, in the coming year, Lord. We just pray that all that we do, Lord, would be most importantly, would bring honor and glory to your name. Lord, continue to use us in a mighty way, Lord. We love you. Thank you for all that's been done. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You are dismissed. Amen.